CCDC is pleased to bring you Interview Tools for People with Disabilities with Louise Vaughn. Okay, we are delighted to have all of you join us for this webinar with Louise Vaughn, who is the Director of Human Resources for the Arc Thrift Stores. So I'll I'll let um, Louise do any further um, introducing her background or what she does, but um, please add any of your questions into the chat box and at the end Louise will um, answer um, your questions as time allows. Thank you for joining us and thank you, Louise. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. This is really exciting. I do have to share with you, this is my first webinar via Zoom. So I'm not sure how well this is gonna go, but we will certainly give it a shot. I think in these times, we're all learning new skills that we didn't have before. And I, I have to really say, a couple of months ago, I didn't, hadn't even heard of Zoom. I wasn't even sure what it was. So we will give this a shot. Uh, yes, I've been the um, <clears throat> director of HR and a couple of other departments at ARC Thrift for almost 17 years now. Prior to that, I was in the for-profit world for many, many years, 30 plus years. So, um, But we're going to talk today. They asked me to talk about interviewing and how to uh, interview for jobs. How does that look? What does that look like? And then more importantly, if you require an accommodation, if you have special skills or you require accommodations, how do we address that in the interview process? At, at our company, at our thrift stores, we have over 350 people who have disabilities whether it's cognitive or physical or both. So we uh, employ quite a few people. But so that's how we're gonna, that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, there are a couple of, I just did three different uh, overheads or uh, PowerPoint presentations. So we're gonna start off with interview essentials. And as Don mentioned to you, if you have questions, since we have such a large group, uh, put those in, uh, what, what did you call it, the chat box? Yes. Is that right, Don? Exactly. Okay, and then we will get to those. I promise you we'll get to all your questions. And maybe during this whole process, um, some of the questions will be answered. So we're going to talk about uh, interview essentials first. And uh, there are many, many questions that when you go in for an interview, you've identified up front the kind of position you're looking for, the kind of position that uh, is of interest to you, that it may be something that you have uh, abilities or education or background. And so um, you've already identified, you've placed your resume they are now they've seen your resume they're really excited to talk to you and so now you're in the interview process an interview can be done in normal times it would probably be done in person uh, nowadays maybe not maybe they're even using zoom but they're using some manner but they're still going to be asking you basic interview questions and those questions and many of you have been on interviews over the years i'm sure um, first thing, they're going to ask you things like, ask you about yourself. They're going to ask you about what your strengths are. Some interviewers will even ask you, you know, what areas are you working on? What are your weaknesses? They ask you things like, uh, you know, why are you interested in this job? What can you bring to this job? These are all basic interview questions. Many times they'll ask you things like, um, what would you like to be doing five years from now? And even 10 years from now, what are your overall long-term and short-term goals in this position? Um, they'll ask you things like, why are you attracted to this company? And what would be your ideal work environment or the ideal company that you would work for? Um, 
Then they'll talk about your last job. They'll say things like, uh, what did you like least about your last job? Uh, again, what did you like most about your last job? And they'll get into the things like your responsibilities. What were your overall responsibilities in the last job? How did you do those things? And you'll have to, in many times, expand on those kinds of questions. They even get into, why did you leave your last job? And uh, you have to be prepared to kind of answer those questions to the extent that you want to and that you can. Um, they'll, many times these days in an interview situation, they'll ask if you looked at the website for the company that you're interviewing for. And that's a really good place to get information. Finding out what their purpose is. Are they a for-profit? Are they a non-profit? Uh, who do they serve in the community based on the um, type of job that you're interviewing for? So those are some of the basic interview questions. Um, during this time, it gives you the opportunity to get a feel for the company, for the person that's interviewing you. Sometimes it's an HR department who's interviewing. Sometimes it's the direct person who has the hiring capability that you can hire. They will make the hiring decision. Sometimes it's a team of people. Many times you'll go back for multiple interviews. I've heard of locations where they actually interview two or three times before they make a hiring decision. And it, it just depends on the situation. Uh, once they've gotten past the basic interview questions, many times they're gonna talk about what we call behavioral interview questions. And they're going to try to determine through answering or asking specific questions, who you are, how do you behave on a job, how do you get along with others, do you work well with others, um, those kinds of things. So let me give you an example of some of those questions. Uh, they might ask you, what was the last project you led? What was it out its, its outcome? Uh, give me a, an example of the time that you went above and beyond the call of duty at work. What, was the, what did that look like and what happened? These are all interview questions that the interviewer or the team of interviewers is trying to determine how well you will be for a fit as a fit with their team, with their project, or with the position that you are interviewing for. Uh, they might ask you things like, have you ever been on a team when someone wasn't pulling their own weight? wasn't doing their responsibilities and how did you handle this? Again, they're trying to determine what happened, how did you handle it, and they're trying to relate that to their business, their team, and what they're looking for. Um, <clears throat> they might ask you about your greatest accomplishment, what that looked like. They might also ask you about what is your greatest failure and what did you learn from that? What was your biggest challenge? How did you handle that? Uh, one of the favorite questions that is asked in interviews is, you know, you can't always like all of your coworkers or your team members, and how do you handle working with people who annoy you? And I know, of course, that's never happened to any of you, but sometimes we have to work with people that we don't necessarily like or don't see eye to eye with. And they're trying to, again, figure out how does that work? How, do you, how are you gonna relate? How are you gonna fit in with their company and their team? They'll talk to you about and ask you questions about conflict on a job. Did you have conflict and what did it look like? And how did you resolve it? So a lot of times when you're going in for these interviews, it's really a good idea to have some things written down or at least in your mind that you can talk specifically about projects and things that you've worked on and your challenges and so forth. <clears throat> um, sometimes they'll ask you about assignments. If, for example, if you had an assignment that was too difficult for you, how did you deal with that? Because a lot of times they're looking at for people who are take the initiative and try to resolve issues versus just kind of throw their hands up and say, oh, I can't figure that out, that's too difficult, I'll go hand that problem off to my manager. Um, 
So there, again, it's all about looking to see through all these different questions and different ways of asking questions, um, how you are going to fit in. How do they perceive that you are going to do the job that you are interviewing for? And keep in mind, they're always looking for the most qualified candidate, but qualifications only go a certain, to a certain point. After that, you have to really be a good fit for the team and you have to add value to the company. And that's what they're really looking for. Uh, let's see if I have any other behavioral interview questions. Um, describe how you would handle a situation. If you were required to finish multiple tasks by the end of the day, and there was no conceivable way you could finish them. So workload is too heavy, how, do, how would you handle that? And again, they're looking at the fit for how um, you are going to fit into their team and how you're going to behave in, a, in the normal work environment, okay? So once they've gotten past all those kinds of things, and again, they're trying to determine, are you a good fit or not? And the next one is salary questions. And it's okay to bring these things up during an interview. Generally speaking, uh, you're going to have a salary range that you sort of know that that position is going to be from, you know, a certain amount of money to, you know, a higher amount. There's generally a range. Okay, they, the salary you're seeking, so have a number in your mind and you're going to know ahead of time approximately if that position is in that range or not. You're going to have an idea. but. Keep in mind too that in most positions there's negotiations. You can negotiate salary. So if you are in the range, you know that uh, you are um, you can request a certain salary. Doesn't mean you always get it, but you can. Um, so sometimes they'll even ask you what is your salary history. So if you talk to them about what you want your salary to be, or you know it's in this range. They may ask you, what is your salary history? Because they are trying to make a determination if, you, if that's in the same range as, the, as what you got in your previous position. And again, your previous position may have been an entirely different job. So. But you can ask about salary. It's, it's perfectly fine to talk about a range. It's perfectly fine to talk about even specific salary as you get closer. Okay, so the next one, their next type of questions that they would ask for is career development. They want to get an idea of who you are, where you've been, and where you want to go. And many times uh, jobs and positions um, are a step in a career development process. So they might ask you, what are you looking for in terms of career development? What are you looking for? Where do you hope to be in five years or 10 years? They will talk about, they will have already know your educational from your resume, so they're going to know what kind of education and experience you have. But you may have development goals that also include additional education opportunities. So they may ask you, what kind of goals do you have in mind if you get this job? What kind of career goals? Where do you want to be? Um, they may ask you about your last position. They may find. They may ask you, well, if you, you know, if we spoke to your last uh, manager, uh, what would they tell us about your career development while you were at that job, or about your uh, aspirations going forward? So, career development is also part of it because many employers want to know that if they bring you on in this position, um, will you stick around for a while? Or will you be looking for the next job, the next step, the next step up? And even if there's promotional opportunities within the company, they wanna know what you're interested in. So if you're very interested in just sticking with where you're coming in at, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But they need to know that, so you can tell them that. If you're interested in moving up in the organization or the company or the nonprofit, um, knowing that is helpful to them too, because it gives them the idea of, 
of where you might be interested in moving into in the future. So that's career development questions. Sometimes as you go into an interview, it, you know, and interviews are always awkward, right? You're there, you don't know them, they don't know you except from a resume. Um, and so they might ask you things that we call getting started questions. Um, and it's also how you, so these generally surround what would you do in your first 30 days with us, your first 60 days. How would you establish credibility quickly with your team? Uh, how long would it take you to make a significant contribution? So they're really looking at how would you, as a new employee coming into a new team, maybe even managing a team, um, get to know everybody, get to figure out what they're doing, what's important, what are the priorities in the company, and how are you going to uh, contribute and add value to the company. So that's the kind of getting started questions that they might ask you. And all of these things, if you think about these prior to going into an interview, when they ask those questions, and even if they don't, um, it helps you because you have the ability to um, be ready for those questions. And then on the converse, if they don't ask you, you're getting started questions. For example, what would you do in your first 30 days? How would you, uh, how would you, you know, add value and contribute to the company in your first 30, 60, 90 days? It gives you the opportunity to say, uh, well, uh, if they haven't asked, you can say, well, let me tell you what, how I would contribute in my first 30 days. This is how I typically would do this kind of thing. If they haven't asked the question, it's something that's very important that they know about you anyway. So you can even just keep that if they don't ask you that and kind of wrap up your interview with that because that leaves them with a very positive view of, gee, this person was really thinking this through. They actually know how they would approach our company, the new team, the new responsibilities, the new job in a positive way. So that's always a very positive thing. They may ask you questions about you. And as you probably all know, there's certain things people can't ask, you know? They can't ask you things about, uh, you know, your personal life and so forth. You can share what you'd like to, but they can't actually ask you that. But they may ask you things about your work style. They may ask you, what's your ideal working environment? They may ask you, uh, are you okay working in a uh, virtual office as we call working from home or used to call it uh, culture some people like a very structured job and others like a more entrepreneurial situation so you can give some ideas about having already thought about that you probably know if you need a, if you do better in a structured environment or you do better in a less structured uh, less micromanaged environment and so you can talk about those things because now they're again trying to determine if you as a person and your personality and your background and your experience are going to be a good fit. Sometimes they ask you about the kind of personality you work best with and why. And I don't know about all of you, but there have been many, many situations over my career where they've done personality analysis, whether it's Myers-Briggs or it's various other situ uh, types of analysis. And uh, so you probably, you probably already have an idea of, of what your, your best personality is that you work with. So um, they may talk to you about that. They may talk to you about uh, if you if you have if you're a big picture person or you are detail oriented some people do really well with the details and they love the details and other people may do better with uh, kind of big picture and more delegation and projects versus you know tasks and things like that so again they're gonna you probably will have already had the opportunity to think about this for yourself and what works best for you but if not think about that in you know before you get into that particular interview um, 
These are all sort of about you. And again, the intent is that they are trying to determine if you are going to be a good fit for your for their team and their project. So that's the getting started questions. And actually the questions about you, sorry, that was the questions about you. And so now we, we talk about a little bit about accommodations. And accommodations, um, and you're all gonna know your own accommodations that you need, right? Everyone knows that from an individual standpoint. Um, and that should be brought up in the interview process. They should know, they should already know from the standpoint of the resume and so forth, they should have some kind of idea about accommodations that you may need. But absolutely be fearless in telling them what you need because that's critical to your success as somebody in this organization that's gonna add value. Uh, and be prepared to discuss the reasonable accommodations you need. It may mean you need you work for a virtual office environment. You may have uh, different tools that are necessary for you to be successful. It may mean that you work um, different hours or flex hours or any number of things. Whatever accommodations that you need, uh, just you already know what those are. So be ready to share that. And then you really want to focus on the value you're going to bring to the organization, the team, the company, the project, because that's why you're there. That's why they've interviewed you. You have already seen, they've seen your resume. They've seen your work history. They're interviewing you. Accommodations are not the most important thing on their mind. The, the most important thing is, are you a good fit for the team? They've already seen your resume and your experience and your education, whatever applies. The accommodation, they already realize that they're going to need to, that accommodations are part of it. And in this day and age, accommodations really with technology, working from home, all those different tools that we have now that we didn't have 30 years ago, um, accommodations are, are pretty easy. You focus on what you're going to bring to the company, to the organization, and your flexibility. That's what you focus on, is how the value you are going to be adding. Um, but there's so many accommodations that work these days, whether it's working remotely, whether it's a flexible schedule, whether it's job sharing, all of these things uh, can happen very easily with the technology that we presently have. Um, so now let's move on to the next slide, Don, if you don't mind. I think now we're, some of the times, the reason I brought up video job interview, obviously we're on Zoom, but um, uh, doing a video job interview can be a little frightening for people, right? So we put together some, some tips on this, and you all may be much better at this than I am, but um, many times, especially now and probably going forward, there'll be more and more opportunities to do video everything, job interviews, work, certainly meetings, you know, the Skype, the FaceTime, the Google Hangout, Zoom, all those things. And there's probably even more out there I don't even know about. But one of the most important things once you've set this up and you're gonna have a video interview, is to be sure that your technology is working. So for example, this is my first, I've been on a couple of Zoom calls where I have been a participant, but not leading it. So this time, you know, I wasn't quite sure I had the tech right, but luckily it's working. So thanks to Don and the CCDC staff, not, not to me, but making sure that your technology works. And I know there's all kinds of things about lighting and your background and noise and all that kind of stuff. So you guys probably know all that, but just uh, if you don't, then get somebody to help you out with that so that you have the mechanics of the video interview. And basically you just make sure that all your technology is good. And of course you probably all know how to handle that. So there could be, you know, internet speed, it could be a, a clear HD video connection, 
those kinds of things. Um, make sure that you have a plan if things don't go well, so that even if you have to do the interview over your uh, just a voice only, you could do that too. So always have a plan. So if things don't go well, there's a plan. Uh, choose the right setting. Of course, remember it's an interview, so you still have to dress the part. Even though I'm not a very good example of that working from home in my, in my uh, not very professional attire, but I knew you guys wouldn't care. Uh, body language. On the video, it's the same thing. You know, we get kind of comfortable with that. It's the same thing. It's body language is important. This is still an interview. Um, let's see. <clears throat> you can have notes. In a video, it says don't rely on notes, but that just means you need to be able to talk about the things that you've done, your education, your experience, how you're going to add value. And, uh, you know, you'll make a good impression with all those things. All right. Then the last part of this is interview follow-up and and following up the interview follow-up is it's interesting some people do it really well and some don't do it at all I think some people think that well okay I gave it my best shot and if they like me they're going to contact me and I don't want to bother them but there are some standards for this and there's always a follow-up in email be sure to do that as a thank you as a whatever works. I've had notes, you know, people still send thank you notes through the regular mail. You know, a lot of them do emails, those kinds of things. But <clears throat> it's important to send that thank you letter, however you do it, whether it's an email or a note or, or however you want to communicate. It helps the interviewer as they're looking at multiple candidates, remember you. Oh, that's the person that sent the thank you letter. Most people don't, by the way, you know. It's rare. I'd say, you know, one out of 50. So just by sending that thank you letter, you are already putting yourself kind of on the top of the list because you, you did that and it's kind of a uh, something that's not done very often anymore. And then what everyone wants to know, of course, you're all going to get the job, right? But if you don't, what everybody wants to know is, why didn't I? And so it's probably not something that you'll ever really know, but there are typical reasons. The typical reasons that a candidate doesn't get a job is someone else was more qualified, someone else was a stronger fit, or maybe had a skill set that you don't have, and, and you won't really know that. Um, the other thing is, is another candidate may have had a stronger connection internally to the organization. You always have that, right? It's all often said, you know, through networking is how you find jobs. People who you know, who know about openings. And we know that that's always the best way to, to do it, uh, the most successful way. But it doesn't always happen. And lots of people get jobs every day. And so... Um, Unfortunately, you don't really hear the specific reasons from the employer. They aren't obligated to tell you, but it's just the best thing is just keep positive and apply what you've learned in your next interview experience and just keep going and you will. The other thing is do talk about your job search and what you're interested in with everybody you know. You will, and because that, that connection between people is very, very important. You never know who's going to um, know about openings. And uh, it, it's a little bit easier when that happens. So um, would you like to open it up for questions now, Don? Or Angela, you guys ready for questions? Two of them in here uh, already. One was when you're talking about showing, um, you know, answering I, I don't know how to do something. You said, you know, if you've struggled with um, completing a, you know, a, a series of tasks by the end of the day, doesn't that show weakness is one of the questions. It could be a couple of things. One is sometimes people assign tasks, not really in a realistic manner. And so as, as a, an employee, it's okay to say, okay, I have too many things here. And, uh, but I, so I need to prioritize. So, you can prioritize for yourself, 
or you can have the person who's assigning you tasks prioritize for you. But it's a common problem. It doesn't demonstrate weakness. It, if you bring that up, it really demonstrates that you are going to be able to uh, ask appropriate questions. Yeah, when there's too much work, there's too much work. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to prioritize it. Either you can do that yourself in some cases or somebody else can help you do that. So the communication is key. And so by saying to someone, to a manager or a supervisor, uh, wait, I've got 10 hours worth of work and I'm only here six more hours. So what takes precedence? That's a good way to communicate. Got it. The other question that's already in the chat box is what if you don't have work experience? Then that's okay. You can go in and say, I don't have work experience. And then you look for jobs that are entry level positions, but that's okay. We all didn't have work experience at some point. You know, we weren't, we all started off somewhere and that's totally okay. Again, that whole communication and, and honesty is what's critical. We hire people all the time without experience. So you talk about the fact that so many people are laid off right now. Yes. A, a sense of what happens when we're released from home. Well, <laughs> So what I, and I, I, this is just my personal opinion. And of course we, we have conference calls almost on a daily basis about when we're going to open our stores again, because our stores are closed right now. We are accepting donations at the back and so forth and so on, but, and we're collecting food and all kinds of things for food banks. But um, yeah, we are unprecedented in unemployment, but once the stay at home orders are lifted and I think we'll see gradually businesses opening back up and I think we'll have, you know, people will start bringing people back if they can, if they didn't, a small business might not be able to, we'll just, that, you know, it's a very difficult time for them. But I see that we will have, I think we'll have businesses reopen, we'll have jobs again, will have uh, the economy to start up. I think it'll take a long time. But that's just me speaking. I have no crystal ball, I promise. Uh, I just think it's gonna take uh, months and months and months. Maybe by the end of the year, we'll look at something like, you know, a much lower unemployment rate. But right now it's scary out there. Do you think generally people will be able to go back to the jobs that they had? Well, I think a lot will. It's going to depend on who they worked for. Did the, their employer go under? Did they have to file bankruptcy? Did they lose everything? Uh, or do they have um, the ability to restart their business? Did they get enough assistance? Because some of these small businesses are getting small business loans and, and grants and those kinds of things. And do they have enough um assets to keep them going through this especially not even knowing when it's going to be over with mm -hmm. you know so um, we have a question from becky i'm going to unmute her she had written not a question but it can be helpful when someone highlights any volunteer go ahead oh. becky yeah i guess i didn't have anything else to share other than um i'm actually a volunteer coordinator and i know a lot of times if you do volunteer somewhere or do any kind of community service or help neighbors, um, that can be something that you also put on a resume that might be helpful if you don't have job experience. Absolutely. We have actually many of our employees uh, start off as volunteers and then we hire them into the same store that they volunteered, whether it's court ordered or regular volunteers, people who just want to come in and volunteer. Absolutely. Um, that's a good prerequisite for working and it shows that you uh, have the ability and the desire and you wanted to contribute. So that's, that's a very good point, Becky. All right. Thank you, Becky. Um, Linda Davis, you are unmuted. You were talking about asking about hiring individuals and how to be a better interviewer. Yeah, I was hoping that you could discuss how to hire individuals with disabilities and how to become a better interviewer. Sure, sure. Well, I think the key to hiring and interviewing people with disabilities is to do, to identify, first of all, what are they looking for? 
what type of accommodations do they need and what are their interests um, and because everyone as you guys all know more than I do uh, people come with all different levels of abilities and disabilities with with all kinds of challenges and all kinds of accomplishments in that case Linda I would tailor it to the person or try to tailor it to the person that you are interviewing and um, and also for the type of position because you're going to have some idea about um, their background their even perhaps their challenges if you're interviewing someone that you've uh, have a little bit of background with but I would tailor it I think the answer is I would tailor it specifically to their needs from an interview standpoint and also from an accommodation standpoint does that okay help? and any tips on how to become a better interviewer to hire the right people oh sure that you know that's something that we work with because part of the issue is when you're interviewing someone for a position you have maybe 30 minutes an hour maybe if you've done a couple of interviews that means a couple of hours and so of course um, getting to know them being as in tune with that person at that time as you possibly can be uh, as empathetic and trying to find out who they are what's important to them how do they deal with work situations how do they how do they like to work um, the more the better communication that goes on there then the better idea you will have as an interviewer if they're going to fit in the position that they're interviewing for thank you the other thing linda too is references sometimes and a lot of times people put references on their resume because those people will say they walk on water right but sometimes you know you can just talk to the references and ask them sometimes they will you know be they'll they'll give you specifics about this person in their former work environment that might be helpful to you most of the time references aren't going to say anything negative or they wouldn't be references right <laughs> so, we hope so <laughs> yeah uh anything else there for linda no okay great um Thanks. okay andre i'm gonna unmute you Andre, you wanted to know about uh, equitable equity. I'm gonna let you do it. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious um, if you have any tips about how to be more equitable in the hiring process. Uh, we freely offer like ASL interpreters and things like that, but are there any other tips, uh, things that we can do that maybe we're not thinking about to make the process equitable for everybody? Um. Yeah, I think knowing the person that's being interviewed on a, uh, you know, uh, from the standpoint of what kinds of accommodations do they need, whether it's, um, you know, ASL or it's any other type of accommodation and helping in advance work through that so that the interview process goes as smoothly as possible. That would be my thought on that. Um, um, I, you're probably already helping with resumes and with role playing and things like that. Is that right, Andre? Um, not myself in particular, just uh, in general. In general, just trying to make sure that anybody who applies is competing on an equal playing field. Right, right. And I think that making um, making all technology available so if someone wants to uh, interview via the a zoom call or via a FaceTime call or something like that allowing that and as an interviewer um, encouraging that the hiring manager and the interviewers and whoever is involved in the process uh, looks at all that as a level playing field that people who um, may have a disability may have so much to offer and that they need to look past whatever that disability is 
And that's one of the things we encourage a lot with people who are interviewing, whether it's our company or other companies, is helping people look past the disability and recognize the value added and, the, and all the con contributing aspects that everyone has for these jobs, any job for that matter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here. There we go. Okay, Christina, go ahead. Hi, I was wondering if you could help um, me understand as somebody who is hiring for a position, what type of accommodation requests I can expect from applicants with disabilities um, to ensure that we're um, doing our best to, to provide the best experience possible and ensure everybody has a, an equal chance at success. Of course. Um, so what I would want, what I would ask is that in your interview process that you would ask your candidates, because a lot of times we don't know, right? You would ask your uh, candidates, do you need any accommodations during this interview process? And if you, as the interviewer and as the company are proactive in doing that, I think your, your candidates will be comfortable enough to say, well, yeah, I really like to do the interview over Zoom or, um, uh, you know, I'd like to come in for an interview and uh, you're on the third floor or there are elevators, you know, whatever accommodations they need and then people can mention to you. But if you are proactive in asking about accommodations, then they would probably feel much, have a higher degree of comfort in uh, stating what they need. So that's kind of the way I'd approach it. The thing is, Christina, we, you don't really know by looking at a resume. So the key is to make people very comfortable in, in knowing that accommodations are welcomed and that as the company and as the interviewer, you're asking them about that. That's the way I would approach that. Would that work for you? Yes, thank you so much. Sorry, I, I, I couldn't unmute myself for a second. I appreciate That's okay. That. That's okay. We're all, I'm learning how to use Zoom. I don't really, <laughs> I haven't figured this one out yet, 100%. So. But thank you for the question. That was a good question. I think it's incumbent on the companies and the interviewers and the hiring managers to make, uh, to ask those questions, not knowing yet, but then they can, there's a higher degree of comfort level and inclusion for anyone who's being interviewed. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate, I hope that this was helpful to you. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you. Thanks for asking me. It was really fun. Now I can say I did one Zoom webinar. <laughs> and you did it well. Oh, well, thank you. I hope it was okay. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate everyone being on the, on the call, on the meeting.